stand in one minute. Uh, don't come to our, ch our church. We stand for 40 minutes and worship the Lord. And nobody sits down. We enjoy worshiping God, and I know you do too. Hey, by the way, this thing already started, the 35? Where's Keith? I rebuke that thing in the name of the Lord right now, brother. You got to give me five extra minutes because uh, all I was doing was getting the people ready to get to heaven. Let me talk to, tell you about, about being bilingual, by the way. If you're in Southern California, you better be bilingual. You better know how to say enchiladas and tamales and frijoles and tacos. You might as well know how to say that, and, and you, you might as well know how to say pizza. <laughs> Is that Italian? Oh, my God. There was this little cat. I mean, I'm sorry. I started wrong already. This little mouse from uh, Beverly Hills. Yeah. Beverly Hills. He was living in the, you know, the, the, the high life, and he decided to go to the inner city of Los Angeles and visit it. He's heard a lot about Los Angeles. You're like you guys that came from someplace else, and you said, you know, I'm going to go see Los Angeles. And so he got his little backpack and moved out from, from Beverly Hills all the way down to Los Angeles. No sooner had gotten into downtown Los Angeles that he saw this huge cat. I mean, big and fat and ugly. And that cat looked at him. They looked at each other, and the little mouse says, just in case, I'm going to take off running. He starts running down the street. Guess what? The cat takes off, takes off after it, and it goes down this street and down the other and down the other street. And looks back, and that little, that big old cat is coming after him, and that little mouse is all scared, going down another street. And there's a lot of streets in Los Angeles, down this alley, down the other street, down this alley. And finally, he finds a little hole in the alley, and he goes into the little hole. And he says, <sighs> he says, man, they're big and mean in the city. And uh, you see, in Beverly Hills, they're all skinny because they're all on diets. Well, that's besides the point. But anyway, in the city, they're all big and fat. And so this little mouse is there. All of a sudden, the little mouse hears a bow wow. And the mouse, intelligent mouse, says, you know what? A dog, a cat, they don't get along. And usually, the dog stays in the mouse and, and, the, and the cat will leave. So that means that the cat is gone. I can come out because dogs don't like mice. So I'm safe. So he comes out of the little hole, and guess what? There's this huge cat and just grabs it. He said, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't I hear a dog, a dog bark? And the cat says, bow, wow. It's good to be bilingual in the city. It's good to be bilingual in the city, and it's good to be bilingual if you want to get to heaven. You've got to learn a little bit of Spanish. If you have your Bibles, you want to open to Acts chapter 3. Thank uh, Keith and uh, the rest who invited me to come. I'm blessed to be here tonight to see my friend John Perkins that I haven't seen in a while. Last time we were traveling together, we were on a plane together, and we talked about a lot of good things. I, uh, I love this ministry. When you talk about church planting and the commitment to, to reach into our communities, our cities, especially the urban setting, it just touches my heart. Uh, where in the world did we get the idea to plant already 74 churches and one in the makings right now and another one is coming up real soon? Uh, from this verse here, in chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 6. You see, uh, we get ideas uh, as to how we should go about planting churches and uh, many times the ideas that we have uh, get us get it uh, to the point where it's a little complicated. Um, you know, I've I've seen a lot of manuals on church planting, and you get all these surveys that you've got to take before you go there, and you've got all these uh, rules that you've got to follow, and all these blanks that you've got to fill in, and and uh, books that you've got to read, and all kinds of stuff. And and by the time you're done with that, it says, you know, forget it. I'm not going to plant a church. It's too complicated. And uh, then in, in our particular setting, you know, most of us don't have any money. We planted 74 churches. We started with no money. We still have no money. How did you plant 74 churches? With no money. We trusted God. We've got churches all the way from Argentina to Northern California. And uh, what I find is a guy, a man or a woman, that God has gotten a hold of their heart, put some passion in there to, to win souls, and I said, you know what, I'm going to pray over you. And I bring him before the congregation, I lay hands on that guy, and I says, now go and do it. Don't expect a penny from me. I'm not going to pay for anything. You go and do it. Once you've done it, I'll, I'll, I'll kick in and help. That's the way I, I like to do things. We put him to the test, if you will. 
And I tell you what, God has never, never stood back and said, well, you know, let the kid go and fall on his face and mess things up and, and, and uh, I'll just watch him do that. God is always going before that person. And it's not long before we find that that guy, that man, that woman, all of a sudden establish a church and, uh, and I go and bless the church in the name of the Lord and we enter into a relationship and then three years later I let him go. I don't keep those churches. We're not a denomination. We're just mothering churches. We're mothering children. And we're saying, Lord, there's your, they are yours. God bless you and take off. When we let them go, they're self-propagating uh, churches. They're self-governing churches. And they're support, self-supporting churches. And they never ask for a penny from anybody. We help them because we want to help them. The key is finding somebody that cares. Secondly, somebody that says, man, you know, I don't have any gold nor silver. But what I got, this is what I'm going to give you. I've got Jesus. Guys, that's all we need. Remember the old chorus? He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. Uh, this young man that shared with us tonight about Skid Row. I mean, you find them all over the world. God all of a sudden gets a hold of somebody that, that says, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here, but there's something in my heart and my gut that won't let me go. I've got to stay here and I've got to do what God has called me to do. I don't, I don't know where I'm going to get the money or the help or whatever, but I'm going to trust God on this one. And guess what? God honors that kind of faith and commitment. God blesses it. God inspires it. God makes it grow. And great things happen. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. I've got Jesus in my heart. I heard a lot. You know, Peter is saying, you know, I heard him talk. I saw him act. I, I saw how he do it. did it, so I'm going to do it too. So tonight, let me say the following. I'm not going to offer you a model. I'm not going to speak of the way we've done it. I'm just going to try to once again challenge you to do it. Because you can do it a dozen different ways or a hundred different ways. The thing is to do it. And so tonight, what I want to do, first of all, I want to say a little bit about this country of ours. It's in an absolute mess. I don't care if the Republicans won. We're in an absolute mess. If you haven't looked at the city lately, it's time that I open your eyes and take a good look at it. It's in a mess. If you're not looking at our suburban settings, you know they're in a mess. And we need to do something. But the way we're going to do it is not by just sitting together in a room like this and studying all over again. Thank God for these conferences and thank God for the books and the seminars and the tapes and, the, and, the, and everything that we can get a hold of. Thank God for all that stuff. But that's not the way it's going to happen. You're going to have to spend some time on your knee before God. You're going to have to talk to man upstairs, and he's going to have to talk to you and say, this is the way I want you to do it, and you've got to listen to him. He's got to get a hold of your heart to the point that you say, you know what, if I don't do it, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I've got to do it. There is, there is something in me that won't, won't let me stop from doing it. I've got to get out and do it. And you know what? Most of the time when that happens, you don't start looking around first of all to see who's going to sponsor you, what church is going to mother you, none of that stuff. You just start looking around for people that you've got to win with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. That's where I want to take you. You know, last uh, week I was watching television late at night and had an article in the ABC Nightline program, Mean Streets in the USA. It had to do with the case of a lady that lived in a, in a rat and drug infested housing project. She called the police repeatedly because of a little gang that were selling drugs right next door to her, especially a young man that lived there. She made it hard on him and he did everything he could to create hell for that lady. Finally, he broke down her door, walked into the apartment, poured gasoline all over the place and, and cost her death along with her five children. This is typical of something that is happening every day in America, and you guys know it as well as I do. There's three things that, I, that we need to address right on. Number one, the heart of our communities is sick, and I'm talking about the home. We have failed as a society to take care of the most basic unit of our society, the home. As goes a home, so goes, goes society. The President's Task Force in Society in America has said you can trace all ills to the breakdown of the family. John DeLulio said not too long ago, the biggest threat to the American youth is not drugs, illicit sex, teenage pregnancy, or even dropping out of school. The biggest threat is pessimism that is spawned in the homes of our nation. And the main reason for this, I say, is a lack of love. Jesus said because of the increase of lawlessness, 
Love will wax cold. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you haven't noticed, we don't have the love that we need in the home today in America. That has brought about the condition that we have in most of our neighborhoods, in most of our cities. It is hard to believe that we live in a time when the home has become the place of abuse, abandonment, and even death. Secondly, not only is the heart sick, the environment is poisoned. Our neighborhoods, our kids are breathing in air that is polluted with poisons that are much worse and deadlier than any chemical that comes from any exhaust or smokestack. They're breathing in the poison of hopelessness in the very place where you would expect to find all the help you need, the home. They breathe in the poison of meaningless from a society that has told them there is very little hope for you in the future. Why behave in a civil way when all around you adults are demonstrating the opposite? Why graduate from school when you can get more money, money selling drugs? We've got to do something about our homes. We've got to do something about our neighborhoods. I am still convinced that the local church in a local community is the best answer to these problems. Number three, the foundations of our society are fast crumbling. Our Judeo-Christian values are out the door. The psalmist wrote, what is the righteous to do if the foundations be removed? The Bible has taught us that if any society is to succeed, it must love God above all else and your neighbor as yourself. Not only has materialism replaced God in America, racism continues to erode any hope for true biblical reconciliation. Respect for authority is no longer a virtue to be admired. Lawlessness is taking over. When our own past president can teach the world how to lie, and the majority of the people excuse him on the basis of how much money they have in their pocket, our foundations have crumbled. We need to do something about it. I want to read to you tonight an essay from a Columbine student, and some of you might have read it and seen it, but let me, let, let me read it again. He writes, the paradox of our time is in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, wider freeways by n but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but we have less. We buy more but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences but less time. We have more degrees but less sense, more knowledge but less judgment, more experts but more problems, more medicine but less wellness. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, not life to our years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We've split the atom, but not our prejudice. We've higher, we have higher incomes, but lower morals. We've become long on quantity, but short on quality. These are the times of tall men and short character. Steep profits, shallow relationships. These are the times of the world peace, but domestic warfare. More leisure, but less fun. More kinds of food, uh, but less nutrition. These are days of two incomes, but more divorce of fancier houses but broken homes. It is a time when there is much in the show window and nothing in the stock room. A time when technology can bring this letter to you and a time when you can choose either to make a difference or just delete. I tell you what, I could not have said it better. That's the mess of America. And if we're not planning churches, we don't care about the mess in America. If we're not taking the gospel to the community, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus never said, open the doors and bring them in. He said, go to them. And we've forgotten this kind of stuff that's part of the gospel. We've forgotten that it's basic. It's simple. It's not complicated. We have made it complicated as a result. We have what we just read this evening. What are we going to do about it? I believe that the church has the greatest opportunity in modern times to take the lead and demonstrate that we can be a better society by putting into practice what it preaches. And if this be true, then the local church in America must be the light in every one of our neighborhoods. It must be the salt that holds back the putrefaction of our society. And yes, we must become the living word to our homes, to our community, to establish a proper foundation. 
There's five challenges that I want to share with you tonight. Number one, we must be oriented towards success in all our planning from the outset so that the resourceful in our communities see us as being able to deliver. You see, they're watching us. They're looking at us. They're saying, these guys preach a great message. Are they able to deliver? They talk about the fact that they can transform a community. Can they deliver? They talk about the fact that they care about the home. Why don't they visit mine? Why don't they do something about my situation? In this, we have failed miserably. If you were to listen to most pulpits in America on any given Sunday morning or most Christian radio or television evangelists, you would think that we have won the world. But the fact is that most churches average less than 100 in attendance and struggle every month even to pay the light bill. What is the problem? The problem is that we don't think and act like Jesus. Jesus sent out his disciples full of his spirit to assure them of success. He said, even the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. We need a new awareness of his spirit in us. We need a new heart that will hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Then we need to stand, even as Peter stood in the midst of a broken, depleted, and hostile society and delivered the message with authority that will cause even the most cynical to respond and say, what must I do to be saved? Oh, God, give us the Peters today. Give us the men and women that are full of God's spirit, full of God's passion, that are not afraid to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, and preach it with authority and with the anointing of God Almighty. I believe that people will respond, and I believe you believe the same as well. Here's the second challenge. We've got to go to the place, the cities, the neighborhoods, where God says we should go, and we'll have much success. But you ask, how do you determine this? Simple. Find out what God is doing and become a part of it. Let me repeat that. Find out what God is, God is doing and become a part of it. I had a church and a, and a Bible college, a seminary, approach me. This happened a few years ago. And they said, Pastor Danny, we want to help you establish a Hispanic church in the city of Santa Ana, the most Hispanic city in America. I said, great, guys. How are we going to do it? Well, the one gentleman said, I tell you what, we have money. The other one says, we've got a lot of students that have been trained in music and all kinds of stuff. I says, great, I've got people. Let's do it. We met half a dozen times, and we discussed ideas and strategies and plans and everything, how we're going to do it. Finally, I said, you know what, guys? Just give me the money. Just give me the money. I know how to do it. I do it all the time. Just give me the money. And with that, they walked away. I've never seen them again. We don't need new ideas or strategies. We have enough already. You know that there were over 10,000 different strategies to evangelize the world in the year 2000? I asked the question, does God need that many? You don't need to strategize. You need to evangelize. You don't need to employ. You need to deploy. Money is not the problem. Lack of vision is. He said, if you follow me, I will show you how to be fishers of men. Go where he goes. But you've got to spend some time with him. You see, you'll never know his voice until you spend time with him. So you'll never know when he's giving you orders, marching orders, and he's telling you, don't go here, go here, unless you spend time with him. There's a lot of voices calling us today. I mean, from the White House. I've never been to the White House like I've been lately. And they're offering all kinds of stuff to us. And we can start listening to that. And we can start listening to the, to the neighborhood uh, social club. Or, or we can start listening to the, to the uh, community activists. And all kinds of voices all over the place. But have you listened to God? You see, God has the answer. God has a way. How many know that he'll never send you where you're going to fall on your face and be a failure? He loves you too much for that. He loves us and he cares about us. And he cares about our people and our cities and our communities. The third challenge is a church is great in need of enablers, facilitators that will help drive the vision. We're lacking God-sent leaders. I'm going to say that again. We are lacking God-sent leaders. 
That's what I look for when I establish a church. I want to make sure that God has dealt with that person. And that person comes to me because he can't stand it any longer. You know, most of those guys that I have pastoring churches today, they never went to seminary. They never went to a Bible college or a Bible school. They've taken courses by correspondents. They can't afford a Bible school. They cannot afford a seminary. But they had spent time with God, and it was very obvious when they came to me. And they said, Pastor, send me. I've got to do something. We're lacking God-sent leaders. I'm concerned that so many called, so, so-called church leaders have chosen this vocation and have not been called to this vocation. God is still in the calling business. And if we are to succeed, now more than ever, we need to find the called ones. I want to say that again. We need to find the called ones. If there's one thing about choosing the calling, and there's something else about being called to do that work. You see, when you're called to do that work, again I say, you don't look for help. You look to God. A generation of great men and women are coming to their end, such as Billy Graham and Bill Bride and our own brother John Perkins. We need a new leadership to emerge that will resemble the great Apostle Paul, unsolicited, unconventional, with vision and passion in their souls to become risk takers. Many would have quit a long time ago if they would have gone through what John Perkins has gone through to, the, to this point in his life and ministry. Most young applicants today to the ministry want to know how much are they going to be paid and what are the benefits that they are going to be given if they accept a call to a church. I tell you what, God bless us with new risk takers that will say, you know what, just tell me to go, Pastor. Just tell me to go. I have a young man pastor in a church in Santa Ana. Myron Yanes came from Guatemala. Came from a totally messed up family. I mean, talking about dysfunctional, he was doubly dysfunctional. His family was. God got a hold of him and saved him and brought him to our church and we discipled him and grew him up and one day he then he came to me and said, you know what, I, I just know that God has a call into my life and I want to go plant a church. And he told me more or less where we want to do it. I says, let's do it. Today that's a thriving church, almost 300 in attendance. He's in the worst, what's called the worst neighborhood of Santa Ana, the worst neighborhood of Santa Ana, Mini Street. They're cleaning up that place now. From that, from, from that area, we spawned a Cambodian church as well. You see, these guys have been called. And God will bless a risk taker. Trust God. I challenge you, trust God. Take him at his word. Take that first step and you'll walk on the water. But you've got to get out of the boat first. Number four, commitment. Every community needs to find a few men of peace today. Men that are not hung up on some issue or self-imposed vision. And form coalitions of spiritual strength in every community. We need to do battle in the spiritual realm. Our cities are infested with the power of demons. They're holding back the spreading of the gospel. We, not, we need to find men of peace that are connected, number one, with God, and secondly, they can connect with each other and form spiritual networks to break the bondage that we have in our communities. We need the modern Barnabas to teach us. The word says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. It says that two are better than one. The days of super this and super that must stop. Recently, the Anaheim Angels, I just threw this in here for who knows what reason, demonstrated this. There were no superstars on the team. I like that. The team won the championship. Can the church do the same? Christ said we would win the world if ever we became one, even as he and the Father are one. Can we do the same in our communities? What an incredible challenge. I believe with all of my heart that if we get together and form these spiritual coalitions in our communities, bind the power of the enemy, and loosen the grace of God and the power of God upon that community, God will do the rest. Fifth challenge, however, Whoever comes to the table to be part of this new approach to doing church in a community must clearly understand 
that we're partners. And as such, we all bring something to the table. You have money, I have people. You have resources, I have experience. Today, much is being said about community economic development, which is vital. However, a higher goal must be in focus, that every Christian leader in a community sees himself as a community investor, doesn't receive to give, but what he has, he gives. You had something before you got something from Washington or the state, Sacramento, or the county, or the city. You had Jesus. You see, again, most of the time, we've got to get something. We think we've got to get something before we can give it. Peter and John said, we have nothing. We don't have silver. We don't have gold. We, we don't have what, what you know, in, in, our, in our little limited way of thinking, we need to help you, guy. I know you, you, you want an offering. I know you want alms. You want something. We don't have that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, something happened in, the, in that brain of Peter that, you know, sometimes didn't work too well. And he said, you know, but we've got something. We've got Jesus in us. We've got him. He gave us a word. He gave us authority. He gave us something to say. So in his name, not my abilities, not my resources, not what I think I need to have, but in his name, stand up and walk. To me, that's really the beginning of the church. To me, that's where it really started. It started with one guy saying, I can do it. I told our people when I took it 26 years ago, when I took that church, as long as I am here, we'll never have a revival to win souls. Our churches used to have revivals all the time. Some churches still have revivals all the time, and they're not winning people. I said, you guys are the revivalists. You guys are the soul winners. And I taught everyone in that, in that church to become a soul winner. That's why that church is growing. We've grown without radio, television, without going out and passing tracks. We, we, we haven't done anything special, if you will, except to convince every person in that pew that he's a soul winner. And that's why the church is growing. What do we have? That's what we give. You see, what caused the church to grow back then was that none of them said, what I have is mine. They all saw themselves as investors in a common cause. As we all know too well, the church is fractured and divided. Instead of complementing, we compete. Instead of lifting up, we tear down. Can we emulate that first church and hear it said of us as well? And they found favor with all the people, and the Lord added daily those that should be saved. It's going to be, and it's going to take place only when we come together, number one and two, when we all know that we've got something to bring to the table. So what are we going to do about it? Repent from our sins of omission and commission. I'm calling us to repentance tonight. You see, we'll never do it unless we come to grips with what we have not done. And sometimes what we've done that is not totally in tune with God's spirit. I believe that the thing that is lacking the most in our churches today is that God is outside the doors. God has not brought him to speak to us. Because God speaks to us, we'll see what is happening to this congregation. I like those examples. But God spoke to this man. It's happening all over the country. But many are still saying, no, it's got to be my way. Thank God, thank God that Peter didn't say, it's got to be my way. Thank God he came to the point where he says, I've got nothing except his name. Then secondly, let's stop blaming each other, the devil and this country. I've heard Jesus, I've never heard Jesus say that these things would stop the kingdom from growing. He did say that our lack of faith would hold it back. He said, if you march, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. See, the church has to be moving. The church must become the army we sing about and we preach about and we teach about. We've got to actually do it. We've got to invade our communities. We've got to go where they're at. And the Lord has promised us, if you go there, the gates of hell cannot hold you guys back. You will conquer. You will build my kingdom. How many believe that with me tonight?
And number three, let's go back home from this great conference with a new vision to fill our city with the name of Jesus. Even as the New Testament church did. Let's heal the heart of our society. I, I tell you what, it's so hard to reach a whole city. It's a lot easier to reach a home. Don't concentrate on a whole city. Concentrate on a home. Go to the homes. You don't need money to open homes. You need money to open a church facility, but you don't need money to open a home. You don't need money to open a heart. You go to that lady that her husband just left her with a bunch of kids. Hey, you don't have to try hard. All you have to do is embrace her, love her in the name of the Lord, and she'll receive Jesus like that. But see, today we're too, too involved in doing church the way we used to do it 50 years ago. I've used, I, 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 I've used this example before. Imagine downtown Los Angeles in one of those apartment complexes, the projects. This lady, this Mexican lady came from, from downtown, from in the inner part of Mexico with, you know, five kids and her husband. All of a sudden her husband takes off and there she is. She's having to clean houses during the day and, and at night probably working in some restaurant to, to be able to just make it, just make it. She, you know, she has a one bedroom apartment with five kids and probably has a couple of cousins living there as well and they're probably abusing the children. And somebody comes around and knocks on her door on a, on a given Saturday afternoon and says, you know, uh, we want to invite you to church. And she says, uh, you know, I, 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 sh I can't go. I've got my kids, you know, and I, we don't have the clothes. And, and we, you know, I work and I don't have time and all the excuses. And they're real. But, you know, you, you and I, we're used to having them in our church. That's the only way God can save them. That's the only way we can disciple them. That's the only way we can make them grow. They've got to come to our church. She says, well, you know, we'll, we'll come tomorrow morning. And, and, and she says, well, well, tomorrow morning is the only day I get to sleep a little late. You see, every morning I get up at 5. And I've got I've to prepare lunch for every one of my kids because they go to school. And then I've got to leave the, the oldest daughter, which is only 7, I mean 11 years old. And she's got to take care of the rest and make sure they get to you know, school at a certain time. And I've I got to get this bus and go to that bus and go to the other bus to finally get to the house that I'm going to clean. And then I've got to jump on another bus. And I get here about 7 at night and... I'm here a couple of hours, and then I go spend two or three hours working at a restaurant as a waitress because that's the only way I can make it, you see. And, and Sunday is the only day that I don't work, and I can get up at, at instead of 5 in the morning, I get up at 7, and I spend the day with my children. Oh, but you've got to come to church. I believe that if Jesus was here, he'd go to her. I don't think he'd say, you've got to come to church. I think he says, I'm going to take church to you. I'm going to bring it to your house. I'm going to tell you about my love. I'm going to tell you how much I care. I'm going to come to your house. And that's where I'm going to tell you about the love of the Father. Oh, we're working with these 50-year-old models and we're wondering, how come the church isn't growing? It isn't growing because we haven't spent time with him and taken orders from him. Let's go back home with a new vision to fill our city with the name of Jesus. Let's heal the heart of our society, the home. Let's clean the air that our children breathe one atom at a time. I still believe in the power of prayer. I still believe that we can bind and we can loosen. I still believe the Bible that gives me authority to come against all the power of the enemy. We can clean our neighborhoods. First of all, in the spiritual realm. We can clean houses. We can paint houses. We can have food pantries. We can do all kinds of stuff. And we do all that ourselves. But I tell you what, it's more important that we clean the air. There's a devil, there's demons that really hate our people and are destroying lives every day. Let's clean our neighborhoods. Let's clean the environment. And let's rebuild the foundations of this society with the eternal 